Madam President, this week my fellow Texans and people across the country will be celebrating the life and legacy of Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Like some of the best known Texans, from George Bush to Simone Biles, uh, Sheila wasn't born in Texas, but as we like to say, she got there as soon as she could. She was born in New York, but she and her husband Elwin chose to plant roots in Texas, and it didn't take long for her to become a leader in the Houston region. She was a lawyer, then a judge, then a city council member, and finally a member of the United States House of Representatives. When I came to the Senate, I quickly learned a few important qualities about Sheila. Number one, she was passionate, very passionate. Sheila was honored to represent the 18th Congressional District, and she cared deeply about her role as a voice for those constituents here in Congress. Two, she was persistent. Some might even say relentless. She was never afraid to pick up the phone or track you down and try to convince you to see things her way on an issue. And third, she was willing to cross party lines to get things done. Despite our opposing political parties, Sheila and I partnered on a number of bills to notch bipartisan wins for our state. Along with the rest of the Texas delegation, she helped secure critical resources and disaster assistance after numerous storms and hurricanes, which always seemed to find their way to the southeast region of Texas. We worked on bills to support survivors of sexual assault and violence, including the Debbie Smith Act, which was just signed into law this week. We passed a law that serves as a first step toward establishing the Emancipation National Historic Trail, which will stretch from Galveston to Houston. And three years ago, we led legislation to establish Juneteenth as a federal holiday something that existed in Texas for the last 40 years because Juneteenth celebrates something very important that happened in Galveston, Texas, when two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the African-American slaves in that region learned for the first time that they were indeed free. Sheila was a true stateswoman. She was a Texan through and through, and she devoted her life to serving the people of Houston. We'll miss Sheila, both in Texas and in the halls of Congress. And Sandy and I send our prayers for comfort to Elwin, Jason, Erica, Ellison, Roy, and the entire Lee family. Madam President, on another matter, yesterday the Senate notched a major bipartisan victory by processing a package of bills to keep kids safe online. Members of both sides of the aisle celebrated the return to good old-fashioned legislating, but unfortunately that was short-lived. We know the majority leader has teed up a, another yet designed to fail vote tomorrow before gaveling out for the month of August. In other words, we have maybe two days or maybe one day at the most that will actually be in session until September sometime. And then we're only scheduled to be in session about three weeks out of that month, out all of October. So even though we have almost 100 days to the election, we have just a handful of days which the majority leader has scheduled us to be in session. Why he would decide after six months to put a tax bill on the floor knowing we would be leaving the next day is beyond me. It does not strike me as a serious effort to legislate. In addition, as the presiding officer knows, the House Ways and Means Committee had a chance to weigh in on this. The Senate Finance Committee, on which we both serve, has not had an opportunity to even shape this piece of legislation at all. The chairman of the Finance Committee's declined to have a markup of the bill in the 
Finance Committee, which I think would have enhanced the chances that we ultimately would get a bill approved by both chambers and on the President's desk. But these designed to fail votes or show votes, as you might call them, have become a familiar exercise in the chamber. In the last few months, the majority leisure has scheduled show votes on bills that were guaranteed to fail, but maybe provided a talking point or two on the campaign trail. The Senate has held show votes, and by that I mean votes that are not designed to pass legislation that has not been processed through the committees to try to build consensus to see, to see if we can get a majority or supermajority of the Senate behind them. The majority leader scheduled these show votes on bills relating to the border, to contraception, to abortion, to in vitro fertilization, and now tax policy. All designed to fail show votes, not serious legislating. At the beginning of this year, the House passed the bill I referred to a moment ago that made significant changes to the America's tax system. It was negotiated by the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, our Democratic colleague, Ron Wyden, and the head of the House Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith, a Republican. They released a framework of this agreement in mid-January. The Ways and Means Committee immediately scheduled hearings and a markup and by the end of the January, this bill was passed, and passed with broad bipartisan support, admittedly. Given the partisanship that often grips Congress, advancing a bipartisan tax bill is no small feat, but they only got it half of the way there. They cleared the House, but we are the Senate, and we have our ability and frankly, the need, if you're going to build bipartisan consensus, to be able to shape that legislation here in this body, starting on the Finance Committee. The Senate is not a rubber stamp. It was never intended to be, and it isn't today. Members of both chambers have a responsibility to evaluate and shape legislation before it goes to the President's desk. But you don't put a major tax bill on the floor after waiting six months, the day before we're supposed to break for August, and with very little time left before now and the election, between now and the election. Republicans and Democrats alike would like to see some changes to this bill, but of course, if we were to get on the bill, I'm confident the majority leader, because there isn't much time, would simply prohibit any real debate and amendment process, and then try to jam this bill through the Senate. There are a number of things I would like to see addressed in the bill. I've voiced my concerns about the watered down work requirement for the child tax credit, which would allow parents with zero earnings for a year to be eligible for a refundable tax credit. In other words, able-bodied individuals should be working and contributing to the welfare of their family and should not receive means-tested benefits when, in fact, the reason why they have no income is because they chose not to work. We cannot provide monetary incentives for able-bodied workers to stay out of the job market. Some of our Democratic colleagues have announced their opposition to this bill because of the pro-jobs tax reforms. But the bottom line is this. Members of both sides of the aisle oppose this bill for various reasons. And there's one easy way to address those concerns. Move the bill through the committee process where we can shape the bill in both chambers and then bring it to the floor and allow for debate and an open amendment process. We know how to do this. That's the way the Senate should operate, and it's the way it used to operate. The Wyden-Smith tax, tax bill passed the House in late January. So why did the majority leader wait until August 1st to bring the bill to the floor, knowing we would be breaking for the rest of the summer the next day? Right after the House passed this legislation, I asked Senator Wyden, the chairman of the Finance Committee, to schedule a markup. 
but he refused. He showed no interest in giving senators a vote, voice in this legislation. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but I didn't come to the Senate to be a spectator while this legislation moved across the Senate floor. I expect to represent the 30 million people that I have the honor of representing on each and every piece of legislation that comes across the floor of the Senate or through the committees of jurisdiction. At any time in the last six months, the chairman of the Finance Committee could have scheduled a Finance Committee markup to allow members to try to improve the bill, but he simply refused. And the majority leader could have made this a priority for floor consideration by scheduling a vote in February or March or maybe April or maybe May or June. But he didn't. When did he schedule the vote? For tomorrow, August the 1st. He knows that's not adequate time for us to do what we would need to do in order to represent our constituents in the way that they have come to expect in the way they deserve. He could have carved out a little bit of floor time and that otherwise has been used to vote on, on some of the uh, nominations, but he didn't. Over and over again, he's refused to move this legislation through the regular order of the Senate and then sat on the bill intentionally for six months and waited into the final hour before a five-week recess to bring it to the floor. That's why we call this a show vote. It's not for real. But in light of the run-up to the election, this will be, I assume, a campaign talking point that Democrats will try to use to bludgeon their Republican opponents. In case there's any confusion, the rushed vote on the Wyden-Smith tax bill was, is not an honest attempt to pass legislation. Well, all this boils down to the fact that Democrats are offering two options on a bill that's not even been the subject of a hearing or markup here in the Senate. Take it or leave it. Those are the options that were presented. I, Madam President, will vote to leave it. Leave it to next year when we know as the, President Biden has said, he wants all of these tax provisions that expire next year to expire, which will be a $3 trillion tax increase on the American people. 62% of taxpayers will see a tax increase. So we will revisit all of these matters next year. And we believe we can come up with a better product, one which will better serve American families and better help jumpstart our economy once again. Given the fact that the Senate needs to complete things like paying the bills, appropriations, the defense authorization bill, the farm bill, all of which need to be done before the end of this year, I don't see any window for wide-ranging debate on this topic. And it doesn't deserve a short shrift. So I hope we will next year revisit this topic, and I can guarantee that we will have the kind of debate I'm talking about if Senator Crapo becomes the chairman of the Finance Committee and we have a new majority come January.